Whether you're using an internal or external hard drive to capture and edit video, there are several speed factors that should be taken into consideration to get the optimal performance from your setup. Understanding read-write speeds, as in the amount of information that can be read off of a drive or written to a drive per second, can be very frustrating, especially when faced with the advertising powers of hard drive manufacturer marketing departments. The intention of this video is to help visualize the average speeds you will encounter when working with reading and writing data files of various sizes. It's my hope that in visualizing this, you'll be able to ask the right questions and look for the right information when it comes time to invest in your next storage solution. We're going to start off by looking at external drives and the interfaces they use to connect to your computer system. We'll begin with USB. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus and was developed in 1996 as a way to standardize the connections between peripherals like mice and keyboards to your system. The type A connection is the most common found on mice, keyboards, and flash drives, while the type B connection is usually found on scanners or printers. The original design of USB allowed for a maximum or full bandwidth speed of only 12 megabits per second. In 1994, two years earlier, Apple developed a connection type called IEE 1394. The name they chose to use that people could actually remember was called Firewire. The first version of this connection was actually called Firewire 400 and had a max data rate of close to 400 megabits per second. In the year 2000, USB 2.0 was introduced with a maximum connection speed of 480 megabits per second. It was referred to as high-speed USB and used the same Type-A and B plugs to establish these connections, thus allowing most devices to be backwards compatible with systems stuck with the older USB speeds. While making them compatible, the max speed was still that of the slowest connection end. In fact, as we go through this presentation, understand that it is not possible to purchase an adapter that will simultaneously make a device compatible and adopt the faster connection speed. While adapters make connections possible, they max out at the speeds of the lowest side of the connection. Also understand that despite USB 2.0's faster max speed, Firewire 400 had a greater operational speed and power distribution than USB, so it became a favored connection for video editors. In 2002, two years after the release of USB 2.0, it was Apple's turn once again in their release of Firewire 800, with a maximum speed close to 800 megabits per second. In 2004, a connection type called eSATA was released. It's pretty rare to find as a standard option on any computers. This connection started with a max connection speed of 1.5 gigabits per second. Eventually, this 1.5 gigabit per second speed was increased to 3 gigabits per second, and then 6 gigabits per second matching the speed improvements seen by hard drives connected with what is called a serial ATA or SATA connection directly to logic boards in user systems. So essentially, the hard drive connected directly inside of your computer to the logic board. In 2008, Steve Jobs declares FireWire dead, although Apple continued to release systems with the port for several years after this announcement. That same year, in 2008, USB releases its third version, USB 3.0 with a max speed of 5 gigabits per second. This is also referred to as super speed. At this point, connection options are not only reaching, but they're surpassing actual hard drive speeds. Let's take a look at these speeds to help visualize this. Rotational drives contain platters inside of them. Data is read and written across these platters at varying speeds, from faster speeds on the outside to slower speeds on the inside of that platter. These rotational drives can actually be purchased at different rotational speeds, the most common of which are 5400 RPM and 7200 RPM. Because of the varying read-write speeds across the hard drive platter, we're going to compare an average speed for each drive in our evaluations. 5400 RPM drives have a read-write average of 800 megabits per second, and 7200 RPM drives have a read-write speed of 960 megabits per second. These are the average speeds that these drives will max out at. So, a 5400 RPM drive wouldn't see the difference between the speed of a USB 3.0 connection versus a Firewire 800 one. Because the drive averages only 800 megabits per second, it will never get up to the speed that USB 3.0 will provide, which is 5 gigabits per second. The next great complication in this is the fact that hard drive manufacturers, as well as editors and post facilities, have a tendency to talk about these measurements in megabytes per second instead of megabits per second. The conversion is 8 to 1. 
For every 8 megabits, we have 1 megabyte. So, here are the converted speeds for reference that we've talked about so far. Despite the amazing advances in connection speeds, single rotational hard drives can't actually capitalize on these advances. Unsuspecting customers looking at an advertisement for this USB 3.0 drive may think they're getting transfer speeds of 375 megabytes per second because the box advertises how fast USB 3 can go. But the drive inside the case, a 7200 RPM drive, can only read right at 120 megabytes per second. Trickery? You be the judge. But wait, there are storage options outside of just rotational drives. Because of yearly advances in solid-state media storage capacities, solid-state drives, or SSDs as they're called, and these are devices like flash drives with no moving parts, SSDs have become large enough capacity-wise to be used as either system drives or even media storage drives. However, they're expensive for not a lot of space. But the speed, depending on the SSD you buy, can have a peak read-write data rate upwards of 550 megabytes per second, or 4,400 megabits per second. We suddenly have more read-write speeds to take advantage of. So let's take a look at some connection speeds that do just that. In 2011, Thunderbolt, co-developed by Apple and Intel, was released. This connection option, originally optical, then copper, and thereby cheaper, had two independent channels for uploading or downloading at 10 gigabits per second each for a total transfer rate of 20 gigabits per second. In 2013, we saw the release of USB 3.1. This also offered 10 gigabits per second and was called Super Speed Plus. Also in 2013, the second Thunderbolt was released. The two Thunderbolt channels were combined to create Thunderbolt 2 with an official speed of 20 gigabits per second. Late 2015, Thunderbolt 3 was introduced with a connection speed of 40 gigabits per second. Breaking away from the proprietary plug game, the decision was made to switch to the USB-C plug format, making it difficult to be able to identify what something is just by looking at its plug. Apple uses its USB-C ports to input everything from Thunderbolt to display signals and even power. These plugs give users connection options to really max out drive read-write speeds. They also open the door for high data rate peripheral devices to be connected to your system. Before you leave thinking that you'll have to go out and buy a new set of SSD drives to take advantage of these speeds, there's another option that users can take advantage of to give them more affordable rotational drives the speed they're looking for. This option is called a RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Drives. Just as it sounds, multiple relatively inexpensive drives are combined together to create one big drive. By the way, it's generally recommended that the drives you use are all the same in size, make, and model. Depending on how the RAID is set up, and we'll talk about those setups in a second, where one 7200 RPM drive would give you an average speed of 120 megabytes per second, two drives in a RAID would give you 240 megabytes per second. Four drives would give you 480 megabytes per second. You basically multiply it by the number of drives in the RAID. As of yet, putting SSD drives in a RAID show no discernible benefit, especially for the cost of accomplishing such a task. So this is still going to be accomplished with inexpensive rotational drives. There are many ways to configure your RAID, otherwise known as stripe them. Drives can be contained within a computer or a connected external enclosure. Remember, if they're in an external enclosure, consider the speed limits of the connection method you're using. If it's USB 2.0 that's connecting the enclosure to your computer, that's going to be your bottleneck. Here are a few of the most popular ways to RAID, along with their benefits. And by the way, when I use the term redundancy, I'm talking about whether or not the information is stored in two places or just one. RAID 0. This is fast, cheap, with no data redundancy. It requires a minimum of two hard drives inside of the RAID enclosure. And basically, the data amount just adds up. Two one terabyte drives will appear as one two terabyte drive on your system. This combination is most often used when speed is needed and low cost is required. RAID 1. This has complete data redundancy. It requires a minimum of two hard drives inside the RAID enclosure, but this is often called mirroring because each drive is a complete copy of the other. 
You could have four drives in there, and two of those drives will be a complete copy of the other two drives. This RAID will be no faster than the slowest drive on the system. However, it's usually very secure, because if one of those drives fails, you can literally pop it out, pop a new one in, and the information is mirrored on one of your other drives and can be written onto that new drive that's been put into the system. RAID 5. Whereas RAID 0 was fast, this is very fast. It also has data redundancy. It requires a minimum of three drives. Most often, this is found with four or five drives inside of it. The nice thing about this format is that not only is it very fast, but when one drive goes down, your data is safe. This is actually the most popular mid-price RAID for video editing, and it's generally connected to just one computer system. RAID 10. This is also very fast and totally redundant. It requires a minimum of four drives to be accomplished, but it's often created using two matched RAID zeros. This creates a RAID 1 by combining two RAID zeros into one unit. This also provides the speed equivalent of a RAID 0 with the data redundancy of RAID 1. There are other RAID types that we're not going to talk about, like RAID 6, RAID 50, and RAID 60, which are either less common or way too expensive. Also, we talk about safety of different RAID setups, but it's also possible to simply purchase two RAID setups and back one up on the other. In the end, data transfer speeds depend on three things. The rotational speed of the disks, if they even have rotational platters. Remember, SSD drives don't. The chips used by the drive to manage information processing, which is something we didn't really get into in this video. And the way the drive is connected to the computer, USB, Firewire, eSATA, Thunderbolt. Hopefully, armed with this new information, you'll feel more confident interpreting the marketing as well as the tech lingo in finding and purchasing the right storage solution for whatever project you're looking to take on. My name is Robert Scheid. Thanks for watching.